Hey guys, happy Monday. Mindset Monday. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Uh, I know we did. We've gotten, uh, I think we've all gotten used to this new normal where we're living at home, working from home and uh, constantly trying to find ways where we can move the ball forward, move the needle forward uh, into uh, into uh, the next phase of, of our deal-making journeys. Carl, how was your weekend? It was pretty awesome, thanks. How about you? Uh, it was good, it was good. I um, uh, Weather here in Baltimore got nice. Uh, it was really pretty out uh, on yesterday, actually, on Sunday. Uh, so went for a walk, uh, got, got some fresh air. Uh, did my part, per usual, to try to support some local businesses. Uh, uh getting takeout and things like that you where went possible you went to uh, our super penny black yeah yeah absolutely i mean they like many others are struggling and here's the thing <clears throat> the owner of the business was there and she's a she was a super wonderful sweet woman she had no idea the impact of the stimulus bill that was passed by congress now a week and a half ago and what that meant for her business so in addition to paying for some food, got some delicious wings, uh, uh, I was able to uh, leave her a bigger tip than the one I left on the paper where I was telling her to reach out to her business banker and explain how much money she could possibly receive and what did that look like. And, and I know she was super, super excited and she was going to go spend all evening uh, yesterday evening uh, researching that. So very exciting. Oh, good for you, buddy. Uh, but yeah, I have to say, Carl, we're we're both getting a little long in the face. I know. Uh, Check out the beard. Yeah. And, well, the hair. My hair's growing like crazy because I normally have it cut every two weeks, and it's like a month now since I had my hair cut. So uh, I'll have we down to my shoulders by the time I see you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, uh, I don't know if mine will ever be down to the shoulders. Maybe maybe in the back. Uh, uh, I'm custom built for a mullet these days. Just doesn't really grow here in the top center and. Just, just long in the back and side. So, so by the end of this, I'll be full on speed racer, uh, party in the back, business up front. I think uh, that, that'll that work for some seller meetings, don't you think? I do. Well, speaking of seller meetings, Carl, uh, we got a really big topic today for all of you. Uh, the three killer questions to ask any seller. Uh, but before we get in there, I just want to go back to what we talked about last week, right? So last week was a really pivotal week. Last week, we challenged you guys to go talk to people in your network. And if you haven't networked yet, uh, a quick recap. These are four groups, right, Carl? We want our financiers and bankers. We want our accountants, CPAs. We want our attorneys. And we want wealth managers. Yep. So any of those four groups are incredible groups to, uh, to dive into, build relationships with, so that when you're looking for businesses to buy, you can find the off-market deals. These are people who are selling that haven't been listed with a broker, right? Um, and the benefit is you have no competition. It's generally you and the seller who are doing a discussion. This isn't a broker constantly pushing new leads of buyers in or anything like this. So you're gonna have more leverage. It's gonna be a little bit more of a friendlier conversation. Not that they all can't be friendly, but it's, it's, it's an easier way to build rapport and relationship. It is, and these people, apart from the wealth manager, these people, building relationships early, they can help you not only find deals, but also close them as well. Financiers, they've got many that they can invest in deals. The CPA can do some due diligence for you. The lawyer can also do some due diligence for you and write the legal documentation for you to close the deal. So you have to network with these people at the earliest possible stage. And whilst you're quarantined, Perfect time to do because they're Absolutely. all at home. Everyone's they're all at home, and it's easy to get on a Zoom call or a telephone call or or any kind of Skype, whatever, whatever your medium of choice is. You can get on there and you can talk to them. And and I know for us, that's what we're doing. We're doing it pretty much every day, every week, inside and out. But I did want to just before we get into today's topic of the three killer questions to ask any seller, I want to talk directly to all the people who commented last week and say, hey guys, did you actually do what you said? So let's let's go through it, right? We've got, uh, we've got, let's see here, looking at last week, Jeff. Jeff was saying his target is 10 people since last Monday. Jeff, you gotta let us know. Did you hit your 10? If you didn't, how many did you do? 
There's no issues here. We're happy to have you get as many as you possibly could. Jonathan, he was going to do 20 in the last week. That is wow. a massive, that's a massive ask of anyone. 20 conversations, seven days. That is impressive. That's nearly three conversations a day. I hope, hope you did it, Jonathan. You got to let us know if you did. Andy, he was going to do five by today. Andy, did you do it? Let's, let's find out. You got to tell us today if you did last week's challenge. Nathan, he wanted to do five. Nathan, I think you're, I think you're with us today. Yeah, you got to let us know if you did five. Uh, let's see who else we've got on here. Sonia was going to do four by, four by, uh, by today. Murad was going to do five businesses by the end of the year. Forget conversations. He's doing five deals by the end of the year. Murad, get after it, my friend. Leon was going to talk to five. Faith was going to talk to six by Monday. And then Alex, I loved Alex's response, Carl. Alex is going to do one conversation a day. Forever. For the rest of his life. Yeah. Look at that. Come Absolutely. On. So guys, you have to let us know how you did. Were you able to succeed? Were you able to have those conversations? Let us know how you did. So uh, so we can we can see and encourage you and and and, and take help you guys take uh, take your deal making to the next level. So without further ado, Carl, let's get into it. I'm gonna lob up the easiest one of all of these questions, right? These are three killer questions to ask any seller. I'm gonna lob them up for you. Number one and most important thing to ask any seller in this line of work is what? Four words. Why are you selling? Very, very important. Remember the triad. Number one, does the deal fit you? Number two, do you have a distressed, motivated seller of a good business? Very, very important because the higher the distress, the easier it is to do the deal and you're relying less on number three, which is the assets and the cash flows in the business to be able to do a leveraged buyout. So you have to ask the question, why are you selling? And you have to drill down on their answer. Don't, um, don't take the first thing they say, probe, ask, and then show what I call tactical empathy. So listen three times more than you speak. Really let the seller open up, tell you their story and why they want to sell. And typically, it's going to be one of five reasons. It's going to be that they want to retire. As we know, 10,000 baby boomers retiring every single day, and 19% of them own a small business. So that's 1,900 people every single day are retiring and bringing their business to market. Number two, it could be that they're sick or even dying in some cases, and not just them. It could be a family member that they have to go and support, or they could be burnt out. They could be frustrated, or they could have just run out of ideas, and they believe they've taken the business as far as they can go, and they want somebody else to take it on, have the baton passed to them, and then take the business to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. And in today's world of uncertainty, it becomes even more important to understand the why. Are they just faced with one more headwind that they're not willing to fight through for their business? Are they just struggling with the idea of, of figuring out what, uh, say, the coronavirus might mean to their business and whether or not they can pivot or not, presuming their business is impacted? Because not all businesses are negatively impacted right now. And so, so I think the thing is understanding the why is just super, super critical. It's what allows, it's what allows you and I as deal makers to sit down, truly package the kind of deal and offer that matches what they're looking for. Carl, we, we talk about your some of your past examples all the time. Again, this brings me back to uh, your uh, your radio company on the West Coast. Yep where the deal originally had $200,000 of a closing payment, but by the time things finished and walked away on the deal, she needed $17,000, which was easy, easily financed out of the balance sheet, just to go on a cruise. Yep. That's it. You yep. will never, ever, ever know the why or be able to find a good way to structure an offer if you don't know the why. It's just super critical. So number two, what is, 
the number two most important question to ask a seller. So for me, Adam, it's how does the business work? How is it structured? And you're looking to generate two answers. So the first one is you want to know, is there anybody in that company that can step up and run it once you buy it? And if you want to buy a business and you want to go in as the owner manager, and there's no shame in that, you want to go in there every day and tactically run that business working in the business, then that's fine. But Adam and I, we don't do that. We're owner investors. We only work on the business. We're all about financing deals and then setting up the strategic framework so that business can rapidly scale. So that's the second most important question we ask. Once we know why they're selling, we then want to elicit how does the business work? Who can step up and run that business for us? And then also we want to understand, you know, how does the business make money? What does it do? What products or services does it sell? How does it sell them? What's their go-to-market strategy? How do they win business and how do they service those customers? So how does the business work is question number two. Yep. And and, and I think the, the biggest thing here is, again, we're owner investors, and I know Carl just mentioned this, but at the end of the day, if you don't know who's going to run the company post-acquisition, why are you buying the company? Why are you buying it? Because it's got to be one of two people. It's either going to be you, the buyer, or anyone else in the company, or someone you've got to hire in, right? It's, it's someone who's not you. Um, and you've got to know what the company can support, what the company can maintain, what the company uh, has from an infrastructure position. It's why Carl and I never recommend buying a business, generally speaking, less than a million a year in, in turnover or revenue. Uh, and then we, we also have uh, kind of EBITDA uh, or free cash flow thresholds as well. We're usually looking for 200,000 or more in terms of targeted EBITDA um, or free cash flow. And the reason we do that is because we need to know that the business has enough scale and infrastructure to support the kind of opportunity that we're looking for, to support the kind of uh, ongoing management. We want to be able to plug in strategically. We want to be able to add big value growth opportunity, but we're not the guys to do the day-to-day -day execution at the subsidiary level, at the investment level. We want someone else for that. Uh, and, and, and the reason you want to ask how the company is structured is so that you know whether they're sold in the business or not, because when you go to value that company, that's going to impact your value. If you've got to hire someone or bring someone in or replace someone, most often the seller in some capacity, those are costs you're going to have to bear in order to acquire the company and continue trading it. Yeah. And a great example of that is let's say you buy a business that's doing 200,000 of EBITDA and the seller takes $10,000 in salary and then takes the rest of his money below the line in dividends and you've got to hire somebody at a hundred thousand dollars to come in and run that business then you've got to take ninety thousand dollars off the profitability because you now don't have a two hundred thousand dollar business you have a hundred and ten thousand dollar business because you're gonna to have to pay for somebody on salary to come in and run that business for you yeah and, and in that case if you're going from two hundred thousand uh worth of ebitda per year to 110 and using simple math, you're playing a three times multiple. That company went from being worth potentially $600,000 a year to $330,000 a year. That's a $270,000 difference when you're going to acquire the company. That's almost half, right? And so when you think about that, understanding how the company is structured and how that infrastructure will work with you as the new owner is super critical. And so when you think about it, when you're talking about the number two most important question to ask a seller, that's it. You've got to know how the business will run and who's going to run it. All right, Carl, we're here at the third question. Also, equally as important, in my opinion, as the one we just covered, which is how is the company structured? Because this is the one that's going to put dollars into your pockets or pounds if you're in the UK. But what is it, Carl? What is the third killer question to ask any seller so third killer question to ask any seller and i always laugh when i get the answers is how do you win new business and i have lost count the number of times a seller has said to me 
So, Carl, this is what's great about my business. I don't do any marketing. All of my revenue comes from two places. It comes from repeat business and it comes from word of mouth referrals. Now, I absolutely love that response and I get it virtually all the time for two primary reasons. Number one, if the business revenue is made up or only of recurring revenues and referrals, it means you have a really, really solid business. It's solid enough. The reputation, the quality, the service model of that business is so strong that customers are returning time and time again. And they're raving fans. They're telling their friends. They're telling other people that they know to go and do business with this company. And that's why they're getting referrals. So I love it from that sense that you've got a really good business that's just continually trading off those customers and referrals. But then number two, as soon as you buy it and you start to do some marketing, then you can scale that business over and above that really solid base that you're generating. Because remember, there's three ways you can make money from doing a leverage buyout. Sometimes you can take a little bit of cash off the table at closing. Then as the owner of the business, you're getting the cash flows every month that the business is generating, less what you're using to service the deal. But then number three, where you make the most money is when you grow the business and then you sell it for that big payday. So the more you can grow a business, the more money you are going to make in the end. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and I asked I asked almost the exact same question. Uh, and then for me, I, I think slightly broader than then, you know, how are you winning more business? To me, it's, it's how do you make money? Because making money to me is more than just winning new business. There's a level of expertise that comes into it. Say you're working with a contractor who's bidding jobs. It's not just understanding where the jobs come into the pipeline to be bid upon, but who's actually doing the bidding? Because that person is the person who ultimately has a really big lever on profitability for a company like that. Um, and so again, I think, you know, it's, it's the same question, just phrased slightly differently. And I think the key there, and, and Carl's absolutely right, is you'll find so often at the small business level that there's so much room for growth and opportunity in how they're marketing, what level of marketing they're doing, and then how are they underpinning or supporting the leads that come into the business, whether they're referrals or paid acquisition of any kind. Uh, I think there's just so much opportunity there and we see it on a highly regular basis. Just really strong companies that are doing hardly any marketing. Instead of a day of marketing, what if we get crazy and do five days a year or really crazy and do 10 days a year? And so I think the idea there is that by asking this question, you really ascertain what is the true baseline or benchmark for the company. And if they're doing very little marketing, you're 100% at it which means you generally have a lot more room for upside than you would if someone's got a fully built marketing and customer acquisition program. And what does that look like instead? I know. Absolutely, Adam. And I'm, I'm looking at a business right now in the UK. It's a manufacturing company. And the, the, the seller's like pretty miserable because he makes components for performance motor, motorbikes. So it's like an auto support type business. And obviously a lot of the motorbike manufacturers are kind of slowing down because of coronavirus. And he just does not want to pivot at all into the manufacturing supply chains for medical devices. So he's chilled up ready. He can 10X his business by stopping making components for motorbikes and instead making components for medical devices which that sector is booming right now as hospitals and governments start to tool up um, ready for the peak of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So it's not just growing by doing more of what you do. There are also ways you can diversify, especially right now. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I think uh, the creativity of of a business owner should know no bounds, right? If you're a good operator, uh, it's it's not about getting distracted by new ideas, but it's understanding and having that that gut instinct as to what is the right move at the right time. Uh, you don't want shiny object syndrome as a business owner. That is absolutely the worst case. 
but when you've got macro level conditions like we're seeing now, uh, you've got to be able to pivot and be dynamic with your business in order to assure success uh, moving forward. So I just think that's really, really, really key. So um, you know, we've just got a few more minutes left. Again, these are the three killer questions to ask any seller. Uh, Carl, we'll just recap, recap them real quick. First and foremost is why are you selling? It's the, the four words you can never not ask. If you don't ask this, you will never be a deal maker, period. Absolutely agree. Uh, second question is what is the structure of your company? How does it operate? Who really runs the company? Um, and this is important because we as owner investors don't want to become people who buy a business and then have a job running the business. We want a GM or a managing director or someone in the business to actually handle the day to day. The third question is how does the business make money? How are they marketing? How are they closing new business? Is it all referrals? Are they going to conferences and events? Are they doing some kind of paid acquisition? What are they doing to actually bring in new customers into the business? And then beyond that, what are they doing with the customers? How do they bid? How do they, how do they close the deals? Because in most cases, that is the linchpin of success for, for, for a post-transition uh, you know, acquisition where you've got to make sure you understand what's happening there. So those are the three killer questions. Yep. Um, and uh, you know, we had a challenge last week where we asked people, uh, and I know some people had some results, uh, Nathan last week told us, I think he wanted to do five. He's then posted in the comments, Carl, he did seven this week. So not only did he hit his goal, awesome. but he nice. exceeded it. Absolutely crush it. So Nathan, we're going to give you the direct shout out here. Congrats to you, my friend, uh, and, and nice work. So everyone keep on doing that for this coming work or work this coming week. Uh, we've got a new challenge for you. So right now we talked about Last week, we talked about having networking conversations, conversations with people who, who can help you identify opportunities. Well, this week, we've talked about the three killer questions that you can ask a seller. Go so between them. now and next Monday, we want you to go ask these questions. We've yeah. just given you the framework. So the minimum expectation for us is how many sellers can you go talk to? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? How many can you go talk to? Carl just put up 10. <laughs> uh, but the idea is how many between today, Monday, and next Monday can you get on the phone? Can you build a relationship with? And can you ask why are they selling? Above any other question, that is the most important by a wide margin. So how many people can you ask? How many sellers can you begin to build a relationship with and understand why they're selling the business. So that's the challenge, guys. Leave a comment below if and when you talk to a seller. Come back to this. We want to know. We want to be able to call you out for your success. Uh, so we'll see you next week. Again, for people who haven't started their deal-making journey, and I know not everyone has, and we're giving out a lot of information here, we want to give you one more thing. And that is our Business Buying Blueprint, where, where Carl will walk you through the 10 steps to buying a business. Absolutely free. You'll find it in the comments uh, below. Um, but we want to hear from you guys. Are you talking to sellers? And have you been able to ask them the three questions we've just discussed? Questions that will unlock the opportunity for deal making for you. If you've liked this and you want to keep watching, make sure to like the video, share it with your friends. We're going to be doing these uh, on Mondays, 11 a.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Uh, GMT. And we're looking forward to working through other kind of mindset things to really get you started on your week of deal making. We want you guys to be successful and it's just super critical that we're able to plug in with you. And so we look forward to the feedback from you as you're, you're absolutely able to, uh, to follow along and join with us as we're going through our own journeys of deal making. So looking forward to, uh, to next week. Uh, this Friday, we're going to do, do another YouTube live. So we'll see you there. Uh, we were going to do a red light, green light call. For those who don't know, it's where we analyze a deal live for you. We've got to postpone that topic for a week, but this Friday, we're going to have something else in store for you. So we'll look forward to seeing you same time as this week, 11 a.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. GMT. We'll see you over on YouTube, Dealmaker Well Society channel. Until next time, guys, remember you're only one deal away from changing your life.
Keep cranking, guys. We'll see you soon. Until then, bye for now.